As a junior doctor, you might see many patients with a fistula in ANO, also known as a perianal fistula. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you just how easy it is to understand them from presentation to management and why you needn't stress at all if it comes up in your exams or in real life as a junior doctor. A fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelialized surfaces. Now let's take a look at how a perianal fistula might develop. Here is a coronal section looking at the anal canal. Either side of the internal anal sphincters, which is the involuntary muscle, and the external anal sphincters here, which is the voluntary muscle. Between the two is the intersphincteric space, and here live some anal glands. An abscess can develop from these anal glands, forming an intersphincteric abscess. Now, pus always tries to find a way out. So this is what happens to the intersphincteric abscess. It may track towards the anal canal, and it may track outwardly towards the perianal skin, making a fistula. The formation of a fistula in this way is known as the cryptoglandular hypothesis. Now, fistula tracts can run in a variety of ways, and so they can be characterized accordingly. So a fistula may be intersphincteric, like the one I've drawn. It may be transphincteric. It may be suprasphincteric. And if we remind ourselves of the levator ani, the pelvic floor, a fistula can be supralevator. Now, these supralevator fistulae remind us that the cryptoglandular theory of fistula formation may not be the only cause. Abscesses in the pelvis, for example, a tubo ovarian abscess or diverticular abscesses, may also track towards the perineum through the levator plate. On the other hand, skin problems can cause abscesses. For example, a follicular skin infection may cause an abscess, which may also result in a fistula. As we will see later in the tutorial, the type of fistula will influence how we choose to manage it. Perianal fistulae are commonly a result of previous anorectal abscess that is discharged and left behind an epithelial line tract. We've already talked about the cryptoglandular hypothesis, but when it comes to other causes, the important ones are Crohn's disease and carcinoma, though fistulae may also result from radiotherapy and anal fissures, and also due to infection with tuberculosis, actinomyces, and chlamydia. The history will often be somebody aged roughly 30 to 40 and nearly twice as likely to be male than female. He or she might complain of persistent discharge from around the anus and often following a perianal abscess that may have been formerly incised and drained some weeks ago. They may have a known diagnosis of Crohn's disease or symptoms suggestive of it such as previous attacks of diarrhea and abdominal pain. Symptoms of a perianal fistula may be mild or may have a serious impact on a patient's lifestyle and this is important to note as it may guide how aggressive the approach is to trying to cure it. When you examine a patient with a suspected perianal fistula, don't forget as ever to wash your hands, introduce yourself, gain consent and find a chaperone. Note how your patient looks in general and then lie them on their side with their legs bent up towards their chest. Now, inspect some more. So here we have a diagram of a perineum. This is the anal canal, and these two marks denote the issue tuberosities. Now, when we describe the position of abnormalities in relation to the anal canal, we use a clock face. So 12 o'clock is anterior, 6 is posterior, 3 is the patient's left, and 9 is the patient's right. So have a look, note the abnormalities, and evaluate the degree of sepsis. See if there are any external openings suggestive of a fistula or any obvious swelling suggestive of an abscess. Then palpate to see if you can express any pus or fluid from the suspected fistulous opening. You may be able to palpate a fistulous tract. Palpate any swellings to detect any fluctuance and or tenderness that would be suggestive of an abscess. Of course, you may also find masses, fissures, hemorrhoids, which would also be important to note and characterize. Next, with consent, of course, perform a digital rectal examination and see if you can feel any little bumps or defects in the anal mucosa that may suggest an internal opening. You may now get a feeling for the course of the fistula. In particular, you want to know how much of the sphincter it is involving because you're starting to think about how you might want to manage it. So how can we help you predict the horizontal course of a fistula? Well, we can use Goodsall's rule. First, let's draw a line joining the ischial tuberosities, a transanal line. Goodsall's rule states that any external fistulous openings anterior to this line tend to take a direct course into the anal canal 
and external openings posterior to the line tend to take a curved route to open into the anal canal in the posterior midline. Of course, there are some exceptions to this rule. So we can use this as a tool to help us find tracks and openings, and it's a common question you might get on the water while you're in the operating theatre. The aim of investigating perianal fistulae is to delineate the anatomy of the fistula to help guide management. So how and when do we do this? Generally speaking, simple fistulas, so patients with a first episode likely to have a single tract, don't need to have any imaging, but complex fistulas, so those with multiple tracts, more likely to be found in recurrent fistulas or in Crohn's patients or those with some other complicating factor, and these would require some imaging. Endoanal ultrasound is one way to do this, but a more accurate and now more common imaging modality is MRI. The next step is examination under anesthesia, which following patient counselling could also be therapeutic. So here's another look at our coronal section through the anal canal, together with some of the different fistulas our patient may have. The aim of fistula surgery here is to prevent recurrent sepsis and or to cure the fistula itself. To cure the fistula, we can lay them open. This means making a longitudinal incision along the roof of the tract so that the entire fistula is exposed to the outside. However, for any fistulas that involve sphincter muscle, it may potentially leave them incontinent of gas or solid stool if we were to lay it open. So either the surgeon, after discussion with the patient, makes a judgment call depending on the extent of sphincter involvement, or we downgrade our immediate aim of surgery to preventing recurrent sepsis. If we leave these fistulas alone, there is a risk that the pus may no longer find a way out, so there is a risk of recurrent abscess formation and local sepsis. So what we can do is insert acetone. This is basically a bit of string, of suture, passed through the tract and tied on the outside, thereby keeping the tract open and reducing the risk of abscess formation. In time, the fistula may heal itself, or the surgeon comes back another day to try some other fancy trick to help the fistula heal, which may include plugs and mucosal flaps, but you generally don't need to worry about these details unless you really want to become a colorectal surgeon. The rate of healing or recurrence will depend on the patient, the fistula, and what method was used to try to cure it, and it is difficult to predict which one is going to work. Generally speaking, there may be up to around 20% recurrence rate, and a rate of incontinence following surgery of around 10%. But these figures will, again, depend on the patient, the type of fistula, and the surgical technique. Fistula and ano, also known as perianal fistula, is very common, more so in men, and is an epithelial line tract involving the anal canal and the skin of the perineum around the anus. Anal glands in the intersphincteric space may cause an abscess and result in a fistula, and this is known as the cryptoglandular hypothesis. Fistulas, however, may form due to abscesses in the pelvis or abscesses from the skin and the perineum. Important causes include Crohn's and cancer and also specific infections. The majority of perianal fistulae arise from perianal abscesses. The complaint is of discharge from the perianal skin and you may use Goodsall's rule to help you examine your patient. When you examine them, note the degree of local sepsis and the position of the internal and external openings. You may investigate your patient with MRI if you suspect a complex fistula, or if there are contraindications to MRI, then you could use endoanal ultrasound. Examination under anesthesia, or EUA, would also help delineate the anatomy, while at the same time give the opportunity for potentially treating the perianal fistula, either by laying it open to help cure it, or placing a cetin to reduce the risk of local septic complications in the future. Other techniques include flaps and plugs, aimed at trying to cure the fistula. Following these procedures, the percentage risk of recurrence or incontinence may reach double figures. I'm Danny and you've just watched a tutorial on fistula in ANO. Please do leave some feedback or comments. Until next time, bye bye.